Did Pope Pius XII collaborate with Adolf Hitler? Was Pope Pius XII an anti-Semite? In an extensive interview with John Cornwell, author of the year's most controversial book, Hitler's Pope, we find out that the answer is yes. Now for decades there have been allegations about how Eugenio Pacelli, better known as Pope Pius XII, collaborated with the Nazis before and during World War II. Of course, the Vatican has always denied these charges, but they've kept their records locked up. They haven't allowed scholars to truly investigate the relationship between Pope Pius XII and Adolf Hitler. Well, all that changed seven years ago when Cambridge University historian John Cornwell was given access to the secret Vatican archives. Now, Cornwell was a good Catholic. He'd written a best-selling book about the death of Pope John Paul I, and the Vatican fully expected him to exonerate Pius XII. Indeed, Cornwell himself hoped that the rumors about Nazi collusion were untrue. But to his horror, he found the opposite. Document after document proved that Eugenio Pacelli, the man who became Pope in 1939, stands as a monumental moral failure. A man more concerned with centralizing church authority than with the murder of millions of people. A man not only complicit with the rise of the Nazi party, but according to Cornwell, a man whose silence about the fate of the Jews betrayed a deeply embedded anti-Semitic attitude. Now Cornwell put all this in his controversial new book, Hitler's Pope, The Secret History of Pius XII. And naturally, the Roman Catholic Church has strongly denied the claims of anti-Semitism, and some have even criticized Cornwell's scholarship. Well, I spoke to Cornwell recently, and began by asking him about Pacelli's work in the 1930s in Germany where he negotiated the now infamous treaty between the Vatican and Hitler's regime. Uh, well, first of all, why did he go to Germany? Why was he sent there? And the reason is the instrument, the effective instrument of creating an ideology out of the whole idea of papal primacy was this new drafting of a, a code of canon law. For the, for the first law. time in, in the church's history, we had a code of canon law. Um, but they had a, a problem, and the, that problem was Germany, because uh, Germany had one of the largest Catholic populations in the world, 23 million. It, had, it was wealthy, complex, um, highly sophisticated, many Catholic universities, publishing houses, 400 Catholic newspapers, and a, and a really effective um, democratic political party called the Center Party. So his purpose in Germany was to renegotiate all these old treaties and bring them in line with the new code, um, which effectively would um, submit the German Catholic um, population to a new allegiance to the Holy See Year after year, he attempted to pursue this concordat, the right concordat, and he was turned down by successive chancellors, five of whom were Catholics, because they thought that the Vatican attempts were too authoritarian. It wasn't until Hitler emerged in power in January of 1933 that the chance for these two supreme authoritarians to come together and to do a deal um, came about. Now, why would a pope make that deal? Why would they withdraw Catholics from the political field? Pacelli, even before he became pope in relation to Germany, um, did not trust uh, Catholic democracy. They did not like Catholic parties because they couldn't control them and because they thought that it might uh, introduce democratization by the back door into the church itself. Um, and what were they afraid of? Why was democracy such a thing to fear for the church? Well, they thought uh, that it was uncontrollable, that's the first thing. But secondly, uh, they really did view democracy as a precursor to socialism, which of course was a precursor to communism. Once the Concorda is signed, Hitler is joyous, but so is Pacelli. Both think they've won. Was this was Pacelli simply fooled by Hitler, that Hitler had essentially emasculated the church and then he could have his way with Germany under the so-called protection of the church? Was Pacelli simply fooled and out-negotiated by Adolf Hitler, or was he more actively in collusion, knowing Hitler's agenda at that time? 
Um, Hitler, uh, in his very first um, public statement after the Concordat, said that this shows that the Vatican believes that it can um, live comfortably with fascism. Um, that it almost same. blesses the fascist project. That, that's right, both at home and abroad, so it will lull Catholics into thinking that, you know, the, there is uh, no problem whatsoever with National Socialism, and it will show the world that um, National Socialism is respectable. Um, now, it's interesting that uh, Pacelli was immediately outraged by this, and that does indicate, you know, he had no great love of Hitler, no great love of National Socialism, um, but he was prepared to do deals with the devil um, in the interests of what he saw to be the only, that the best interest of the Catholic Church, which was the centralization. His great statement immediately after Hitler's, he states quite clearly that the triumph is actually the Church's, because what the Concordat means is the acknowledgement by the German state of the right of the Holy See to impose canon law on all German Catholics. Um, so there we see, you know, these remarkable goals which are quite different, um, but which have uh, disastrous consequences for uh, the history um, of, of the rest of this decade. We see this powerful Catholic Church withdrawing from all social and political action, um, which includes the voluntary disbanding of the Centre Party after having voted for the Enabling Act, which gave Hitler his dictatorship. That was all part of the deal. We can now see, as we tell the narrative, I believe for the first time in uh, a general history, work of history, that um, the price of this concordat, the price of this deal, was that the Catholic Centre Party, under the encouragement of Pacelli, should vote Hitler into his dictatorship and then voluntarily disband itself with the blessing of uh, the Holy See, the Vatican, which is why so many Catholics after this, because they had no political home to go, went in their hundreds of thousands into the Nazi party. Was Pacelli simply blind to the consequences of making a deal with Hitler? Or, more horrifyingly, did he care what the consequences were? for non-Catholics? Well, I think he had an extraordinary ability to blind himself to the consequences of his actions all the way through his life. Um, it's interesting that although immediately after the Concordat he said it was a great triumph for the imposition of the, the Code of Canon Law on German Catholics, he actually changed his tune later on. He said that he was forced into the Concordat with a gun to his head and that it was some kind of legal agreement was better than none. Um, this shows extraordinary uh, capacity for um, self-delusion, I think, and we see this actually all through his life. Now, one of the claims in this book is that he's actively anti-Jewish or anti-Semitic. He wrote the following passage during his time in Munich when he witnessed the Bolshevik uprising. Now, the Bolshevik uprising, just to remind people, Many of the leaders were Jewish. And he wrote about seeing these Jews, uh, things like this. An army of employees were dashing to and fro, giving out orders. And in the midst of all this, a gang of young women of dubious appearance, Jews like all the rest of them, hanging around in the offices with lecherous demeanor and suggestive smiles. Throughout it, he calls them pale, dirty, drugged eyes, vulgar, repulsive with faces that are intelligent and sly. Stereotypical anti-Semitic contempt, as you call it. Yes. Did this run through his whole life? Did he view Jews like that? Uh, no, it's the only evidence I've found of that kind of um, um, moral and physical uh, disdain for Jewish people. But um, people will take this in different ways. I've been told by um, prominent Catholic journalists that um, my interpretation of this as anti-Semitic is bizarre. Um, I have to say that the, um, the immediate parallel I found with this kind of language is actually in Mein Kampf, talking of the same group of people and during the same period of time, 
between 1919 and 1920. Um, we have absolutely no doubt when um, we teach in history class um, and, and refer to Mein Kampf as a text that this is, uh, this is uh, typical of, um, of anti-Semitic um, attitudes. Well, when we come back, we'll further investigate the silence of Pope Pius XII during the Holocaust, so stick around. Now, Eugenio Pacelli becomes Pope on the eve of World War II. He's essentially spent much of the last decade negotiating this Concordat with Nazi Germany throughout the 30s. And people know by the early 40s what Hitler's up to. And yet throughout the war, Pope Pius XII never speaks out against the Nazis about the killing of the Jews, the Gypsies, the Poles. Why was he silent? Well, it's interesting that uh, the view of Pius XII, the common view before my book, is that he was the silent pope and that this was the great scandal. Um, in fact, it's a pity he wasn't completely silent because uh, the fact is that he did speak out. He spoke out at Christmas 1942. And this was after six months of um, systematic um, uh, uh, information coming into the Vatican uh, about the true extent of the final solution. I mean, in July 1942, for example, um, it was published in uh, the Daily Telegraph in London and the New York Times that millions of Jews were going to their deaths. All these details were known. And it's known, too, that uh, diplomats inside the Vatican um, were supplying him with whole dossiers on, um, of information. And um, in the autumn of 1942, President Roosevelt actually sent an envoy through enemy territory, a man called Myron Taylor, to plead with him to, to speak out. So finally he speaks, um, Christmas 1942. And what does he say? Instead of telling the true figures, the millions that were going to their deaths, he scales it down to hundreds of thousands. He doesn't mention the word Jews. It's In fact, he says here, I shall, I shall read it, he says in this, what became known as his most clear denunciation, he says, humanity owes this vow to those hundreds of thousands who without any fault of their own, sometimes only by reason of their nationality or race, are marked down for death or gradual extinction. That's right. And this That's all he said throughout the war. That, that is the fullest extent of um, all his statements during the war. And um, it is clear to me that that is, um, it is a statement, he's saying something, he's not being silent. But the statement is um, tantamount to being a denial of the truth and certainly a trivialization of the true horror of, of the final um, solution. Um, in this sense, what he said was deeply scandalous and particularly scandalous to all those German Catholics who might have been moved by what he said, instead of which um, their consciences were placated and lulled. Peter Gumpel again says, in my considered opinion, a public protest by the Pope would not have saved a single Jewish life. It would have only aggravated the persecution of both the Jews and the Catholics. It was a strategy, therefore, a considered strategy of this Pope to remain totally silent throughout the war. Again, is that disingenuous? I think it's disingenuous because it should have been explained to us after the war that this is what he was doing. What, what did he say in 1946, before a group of Arabs visiting the um, Vatican, he boasted that he had spoken out clearly against the Nazis for their treatment of the Jews, when we know that that was simply not true. So he lied? Uh, well, what we certainly know is that he took credit for things he didn't do, which means that he's a hypocrite as well. Why is he being beatified then? Well, the process of beatification and canonization, the making of saints, has become, during the uh, reign of this pope, um, extremely political. We're talking about John Paul now. We're talking about John Paul II. What would be the politics behind the beatification of Pius XII? It would be surely 
that um, his policies of extreme centralization, um, his policies of um, absolutism, uh, his conduct during the war would be um, exonerated, not only exonerated, but actually confirmed. Knowing about this, and you're a Catholic, does this shake your faith? Does this change your attitudes as a Catholic towards the institution of the Catholic Church? Well, I don't regard myself as a particularly good Catholic. I go to church. Um, but, you know, there have been bad popes in the past, and there'll be bad popes in the future. And what we're learning from, I hope, one of the lessons that I've certainly carried away from my journey through the li life and career of Pius XII is that, um, you know, the Catholic Church is not the Pope. Um, the Catholic Church is to be found in all the people of God and not just consented in this one man. Now, John Cornwell's book, Hitler's Pope, is a well-researched and a thorough chronicle of the shameful, the deceitful acts of a pope who has, up to this point, been very well protected by church apologists. Now, the first half of the book is a bit dense. It focuses on church history before Pacelli's reign as pope. But this second half of Cornwell's book is nothing short of a harrowing read. Now, it obviously gave Cornwell no pleasure to expose the Pope Pius XII as a moral failure and as an anti-Semite, but to his credit, he does it without backing away. I would put this book on your must-read list. This is history at its best, investigative, explosive, and finally revelatory. It's published by Viking. I'm Evan Solomon, and I'll see you again in seven. Well, 50 years ago this week, uh, Pope Pius XII died, known as Eugene Pacelli. And we want to spend a few moments talking about this infamous Pope and uh, what your thoughts were on him. Yeah, I, I, exactly 50 years ago, I think it's this weekend that Eugene Pacelli, a.k.a. Pope Pius XII, died. I remember it very well. I was living in South London at the time. I remember my father telling me that the Pope had died and the Catholic Church would never be the same again. And in some ways, I think he was right, because the Vatican Council came along and turned the whole thing upside down and pointed it in a left-wing direction. But, uh, yes, he died 50 years ago this week. A uh, very uh, emotional man, so they say. Uh, he used to have all his meals on his own with just a canary for company, which is very sad. So tells, says Mother Pasqualina, who was his housekeeper at the Vatican, I think, for about 19 years. She was also with him in Bavaria. Interestingly, I think the day after she died, she was summoned to uh, one of the officers, one of the senior cardinals in the Vatican, I think it's Cardinal Ottaviani, who said, your services are no longer required. Vacate the Vatican and take the bird with you. Mm -hmm. So rather sad for the bird as well. He'd probably been quite happy there. But but um, in the early days of his death, I think possibly in the 60s, it was very rumoured very much so that he would be made a saint of the Roman Catholic Church. We as born again Christians believe that we are all saints when we're born again, but he would be confirmed, canonised as a saint of the Roman Catholic Just Church. Just explain to us what canonisation means, please. Well, canonisation is when they open up a file on a prospective candidate who's going to be made a pope. They appoint uh, a devil's advocate, as they say, to look at the man, to find out all of this, and to investigate claims that he was a worthy man, he was a holy man, and that three or four miracles are done in people who say, well, I prayed to such and such, Padre P, whoever it was, and my wishes are recurred. So that will go on for a few years. Then he becomes venerable and then eventually pass on, become canonized, become full-blown saint. Uh, didn't happen, of course, because the, uh, the rumours were still surfacing that the Vatican had been very much involved in the Nazis. The infamous Concord of 1933, which he signed not as Pius XII, but for Pius XI when he was Secretary of State Cardinal Pacelli, was signed in 1933. And there's a famous picture, of course, you can see him at the table signing this. Franz von Papen's there, and we've written about him on our website, and you can read all about this very distinguished, high-ranking uh, Masonic Catholic uh, gentleman, Franz von Papen. You can see Cardinal Ottaviani, who I've just mentioned there, he was Monsignor Montini. And right out of the picture is a little figure standing there, who was Monsignor Montini, of course, who later became Pope Paul VI. But yes, that's when the beginning set, that the Vatican would recognize the Catholic, the, the, Vati, the um, Nazi government wouldn't criticize them too much and in return they were able to practice their um, beliefs and so forth. Of course later on several books came out uh, highlighting what had happened, certain telegrams came forward that had been sent to the Vatican 
apply to the Jews and to their credit certain German bishops saying look you know we've got a concentration camp near us people are being round up in the night we're very concerned about this we've been to the nuncio in, in Berlin I think his name was Orson Ego Archbishop Orson Ego and nothing much is being done about it. so there were people doing something by and large since the Vatican slept walk through this and of course ten years ago the infamous book came out I can't remember the author is it Robert Cromwell? Cromwell uh, Robert Cromwell, yeah. Cromwell Hitler's Pope which you'll probably see flashing up on the screen about now there you can see Pacelli winging out towards this uh, Mercedes bear and this German soldiers standing inside saluting him. Hitler's Pope hasn't the title stuck. Is it not true that the Catholic bishops threw parties for Hitler every year when they're in on Germany? Birthday, yes, yes. On his birthday every mm. year, April the 20th, I mm. believe, there was a big reception and a party held in Berlin. And Pius, and Pius never criticised Hitler, did Pius he? Pius never criticised it at all, no. Nothing was ever said about that. And Churchill and Roosevelt couldn't understand why he wouldn't criticise. He had Vatican Radio and he never criticised the Nazis. We know that priests and nuns were murdered by the Nazis, yes. but the hierarchy was safe. Yeah, priests and nuns were murdered by the Nazis, uh, and a couple of bishops were thrown in there as well, but Pius did nothing about it, turned his yeah. back on, there's nothing done at all about it. And also this. strong uh, speculation that uh, at the end of the war, P uh, Pius XII actually gave Hitler a requiem mass. Rumour is, and I think this may have come from Malachi Martin, but I can't be too sure that Pius XII officiated at a requiem mass. I mean, Hitler's body wasn't there, of course. Mm -hmm. Hitler's in the bunker of Berlin. But a requiem mass can be held in any country, in any cathedral throughout the world, for the soul of Adolf Hitler, mm -hmm. who was born and bred a Catholic in yeah. Austria, as so many of them were. And died a Catholic as well. As far as we know, he died a Catholic as well, yeah. yeah. I mean, he, he was very close to the Jesuits, I mean, which you'll come to in a minute. I mean, Mein Kemp, for example, which was written when Hitler was in Landsberg Prison, one of the editors and who, who looked at the manuscript when Hess took it all down, Rudolf Hess took it down, was a Jesuit, Father Robert Stempel, I think his name was. You'll pull me up it, but it was Stempel, who was anti the Jews, hated the Jews, you know, and did edit the book. And I think in the foreword of the original Mein Kampf, he does thank Father Stempel for his input into this book, for the editing and so forth. And he had a very painful death, didn't he, Pius XII? Like, like all these popes, were very painful deaths. Terrible death, um, awful death. I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy. Um, but but I think a couple of months before he died, he was struck by an awful illness of hiccups. And it went on for something like, like three or four days of hiccups, hiccup, all the time. They could do nothing about it, and this will weaken anybody's physique. And, of course, he died um, very much alone. His doctor then sold some awful photographs of the body lying in the bed, mm -hmm. uh, another count, because he was a count, Count Pacelli, of course. Mm -hmm. So. A lot of these men do have awful deaths, certainly the popes. And he rubbished the book of Genesis, said it was written for Rub primitive, primitive people, I think he said. Yes, I don't think they've ever been pro-Genesis in the way that we would be. I think they've sort of think they, they've given Darwin... Allegorized. They've allegorized. Yeah, they've allegorized. allegorized. I think they've given Darwin uh, the possible doubt that w what Darwin's saying could be right. But uh, yes, he rubbished that, be for, for idiots, mm. so you're an idiot and so am I. Think the man saved? Absolutely not, no. No, I don't think I don't, any of those popes are saved. Mm. And I knew a priest uh, who'd worked in the Vatican some years ago, and he, he was convinced that this, this pope, Pius XII, was the last real true Roman Catholic. Well, if he's the last true Roman Catholic pope, I think that's what he meant, the proper traditional pope, then he's languishing in the fires of hell. So there you are, 50 years ago this week, uh, Eugene Pacelli, a.k.a. Pope Pius XII, passed away... Uh, very controversial pope. He hasn't been canonised because we believe he was too close to the Nazis. And uh, that's his stigma. Yeah, I mean... I, uh, that's his legacy, really. I think the man, what I can make out, was very highly strung. And I think, like so many of these men who are highly strung, I think Anthony Eden was as well, they pushed the problem to the back of their mind and I think they hope that it will go away. Well, of course, Anthony Eden was Prime Minister. He was dealing with world events. But Pacelli was dealing with millions of people men, women and children who were being shipped off to the camps yeah. every day for what, from 1936 when Dachau opened up and we went there and you can look at our pictures of Dachau certainly until 1945 Klaus Barbie was still sending people from Jews in Paris late 1944, early 1945 with the connivance of the chief of police who was a Roman Catholic and with the connivance of the bishops the French bishops who went along with this. And interestingly enough, the pope, man who became Pope after Pius XII, Roncalli, who was the, uh, uh, the nuncio, not the nuncio, what they call it, apostolic delegate in Turkey, was the man who was elevated to Cardinal, everybody was surprised, sent to Paris to weed out these bishops who had been pro all of this and to get rid of them. I think they found about two, became the next Pope. Talk about him another time. So there you are. Uh, we're going to do a series of videos in the coming weeks on Roman Catholicism. Uh, this is the start uh, with Pius XII. As always, thanks for your videos, thanks for your comments, thanks for your thoughts, and uh, Maranatha. Maranatha from this ministry as well.